this scripture before we go into worship this morning, and then we're going to pray. Praise ye the Lord. Praise God in His sanctuary. Praise Him in the firmament of His power. Praise Him for His mighty acts. Praise Him according to His excellent greatness. Praise Him with the sound of the trumpet. Praise Him with the psaltery and harp. Praise Him with the timbrel and dance. Praise Him with stringed instruments and organs. Praise Him upon the loud cymbals. Praise Him upon the high-sounding cymbals. Let everything that has breath... I heard you talking a minute ago. Yeah. So take a breath. <laughs> everything that has breath, that means you. Praise the Lord. Praise you, the Lord. Amen. Yeah. And that's what we want to invite you to do today is just... Worship Him in His presence is everything that we have needed. We believe that as a church. And if you came in with a need in your life today, uh, I may not be able to meet your need, but I know one who can. Amen. God can. And if we'll leave it at His feet this morning, I think He can help you and bless you. Would you stand with me this morning? We're going to pray, and then we'll go into some worship. And uh, we just uh, want you to worship the Lord in freedom and uh, let Him touch you this morning. Heavenly Father, we just thank you, God, today for the opportunity, the privilege that we have to enter into your presence because of the blood of Jesus. And Lord, we can worship you freely this, this morning, God. We just pray that you will lift heavy burdens. God, that you will touch hearts today, God. Let there be a song of praise in our life, regardless of what circumstances we may be facing. And God, as we're in your presence, I, be, I pray that you'll begin to change those circumstances. God, that you'll bring healing, that you'll bring wisdom, that you'll bring peace of mind. God, that you'll bring change for your glory in our lives. And Lord, we just believe you for that. We thank you for that. Have your way in our lives in the service this morning, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. <laughs>
Hallelujah. Lord, we worship you this morning. We thank you, God, that you're forever faithful, Jesus. You're the same yesterday, today, and forever. Our circumstances are constantly changing, but God, you're the one that we can depend upon this morning. God, we worship you. We thank you for that today. Hallelujah. Refresh us in your presence, we pray. Hallelujah. We thank you, Jesus.
We believe that. We're looking forward to that day. Hallelujah.
sometimes our problems seem to get so big in our minds that we lose sight of God and never had that happen. I'm a preacher and I have that happen from time to time. So if we're honest with ourselves, isn't that what happens? Sometimes Satan likes to get in on that, doesn't he? We can do enough on our own, but sometimes Satan comes in and puffs it up even bigger. But we ought to see how God, how awesome God is, amen? How limitless, how powerful, how all-sufficient. Our problems are probably a laugh to God, right? Oh, I can just speak the word and take care of that and he'll just believe me, amen? And so I don't know what issue you have today that's weighing you down, but it doesn't have to be that way, amen? If you'll give it to God, he's going to minister to that situation, give you wisdom, give you peace, give you healing, if you'll just believe him this morning, amen? Because he is awesome. Praise the Lord. As I come into your presence, capacitates of praise. circumstances and Lord let us put our faith in you today Jesus and see that nothing is too difficult for you God no problem God is something that you can't solve if we'll just place our faith in you this morning hallelujah I want us to sing that song again and I just feel like if, if, if there are some this morning that have a need and would you just find uplifted hand say pastor Eric I have a need it may be healing it may be financial and I'm not going to ask you to say anything I just want a, a representation of needs this morning do you have a need this morning I have needs Amen? Amen. Look around. There's a lot of needs in this room this morning. As we sing this song again, would you just, if you feel comfortable, raise your hands and surrender. Whatever that need is that you just raised your hand for, would you say, God, I'm going to give it to you. Amen. I believe you're big enough, God. Do you believe he's big enough? God, I believe you're big enough. God, I don't know how in the world this situation, I've got some things on my heart this morning. I'm saying, God, I don't know how in the world you're going to fix this, but God, I know you can. Amen. That's what faith really is. Faith in what is seen is not real faith, <laughs> Hebrews chapter 11 says. It's faith in what is not seen. I haven't seen the answer come yet, but God, I know you have it. Amen. And I believe that's what he's wanting to speak to some hearts this morning. 
And as we sing that song again, I can just feel the Holy Spirit moving in this room this morning. And if you'll just, by uplifted hands, by a surrender of your heart, however you feel comfortable, say, God, I'm giving that to you. I've given that decision to you. I've given my healing to you. Amen. Jesus took stripes on his back for your healing. I've given that financial issue to you. Amen. He's more than enough to meet that need. And so let's do that as we sing the song one more time. As I come into your presence, past the gates of praise. difficult for you. Lord, I pray that you would see the needs that were represented by an uplifted hand in this room. Maybe some others that have needs on their heart and they didn't lift their hands. God, I pray that you would bring breakthrough, that you would bring answers to those situations. Jesus, we believe that you're the Prince of Peace. And we pray for peace, God, in difficult situations, adverse circumstances, God, that we can't fix. They're bigger than us, but God, you can fix them. And Lord, we place our confidence in you. Lord, we lay that need at the foot of the cross. And we believe, Jesus, what you said on the cross. It is finished. Everything that we need for life and godliness, you've supplied it for us. And God, we just believe you. We believe you for finances, God. Meet that need. You are Jehovah Jireh, our provider. God, we're believing you for healing of sick bodies, God. The doctor's diagnosis is not the final word. God, we believe that you're the great physician. Jesus, you took stripes upon your back for our healing, and we're believing you for a healing touch today on those who are suffering this morning. We just thank you for that, Lord God. Lord, would you just bring answers to prayer, bring God breakthroughs in these situations that are on the hearts of your people today. We'll be quick to give you the glory, to give you the praise for all that's done. In Jesus' mighty name, hallelujah.
I don't claim to know much, and I don't claim to have it all, but I do know a little bit about something, and that is uh, the presence of God. And uh, I can say that His presence is here. Uh, we've already had church today. If we go ahead and pray and leave, uh, you, have, you have been in church this morning. Uh, when you start to praise God, and I'll just give you a little, you know, this is something that didn't come prepared to say, but... Um, that's what we're going to be doing in heaven. So if, you, if you're bored with worshiping God, and you're bored with praising God, uh, you're not going to like heaven. Uh, because that's what's going to be going on. And so uh, we talked about as we enter uh, this place, uh, presence, and we, we're talking about this place here today, and, and thank God for this place. But really what God is talking about is this place right here in your heart. And, and, and He awesome in your heart. Um, 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. And you say, well, Keith, why, why would He be so awesome? I was talking with Miss Rosalie before service today. The Bible says in Jude that uh, he, He's able to keep us from stumbling and He will present us one day faultless before God. Now, um, every one of us knows in here we're not faultless. You think about that. You will be presented to God one day faultless. And you ask, how is that, how is that possible? That's how awesome God is. Yes. And if that's the only thing that you knew about Christianity, that is a reason why we worship God that you have your hands raised. Because you know you're not faultless. But He's going to present you one day faultless. Oh, yeah. yes. You know, King David, uh, I'm a nobody, but King David was a king. In other words, this was a man that didn't have any lack. You name it, he had it. He was a king. But he, he prayed in Psalms, 50, uh, Psalms 86. He said, Bow down thy ear, O Lord, and hear me, for I am poor and needy. This is a king saying, I'm poor and needy. Now, he wasn't poor in the natural. When you're a king, you're not poor. When you're a king, you're not needy. But what made David such a mighty man before God? That was his attitude. God, I'm poor and needy before you. I need your presence. I need your touch. And when you come to that place in your heart, and it's time to worship God, it's not a difficult thing to raise your hands and say, God, I thank you. And I praise you. So, you know, uh, Brother Eric, thank you for having me today. And uh, you judge a church not by its size, not by its, the way the pastor looks or don't look. Judge a church by is the presence of God there. And if it's there, that's a good church. I don't care if there's two people in it. If the presence of God is there, it's a good church. Amen. So thank you for having me. Today I'm going to um, be in the book of John if you have your Bibles. And, and uh, Zoe, you're going to help me out today? All right. So you're going you're gonna, to you're gonna make me look good. All right. <laughs> uh, we're going to have it up on the big screen. Today, and thank you, Eric, again, Pastor Eric, for your kindness and, and generosity to have you. Thank you, everybody, for being here, uh, my First Fitness uh, family, and, and also the guests uh, that they uh, drove in, and the members here of FWWC. Uh, Is that correct? FWWC? Extra W. Extra W, yeah, okay. We're going to be in, in John chapter 4, and uh, I'm going to actually um, share a lot of scripture with you. And John chapter 4, we're going to start in verse 4. John chapter 4, verse 4. And we got it on the big screen here. But if you have your Bibles, you can follow along with me. It says, verse 4, in John chapter 4, it says, But he needed to go through Samaria. So he came to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being weary, from his journey, sat thus by the well. It was about the sixth hour, which means 12 o'clock. A woman of Samaria, everybody say a woman, a woman, of Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink. Verse 8, for, this disciple, for his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. Then the woman of Samaria said to him, how is it that you, being a Jew, ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman. For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Verse 10, Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living 
water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where then do you get that living water? Verse 12, Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us this well and drank from it himself, as well as his sons and his livestock? Verse 13, Jesus answered and said to her, Whoever drinks of this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst, but the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing into everlasting life. In my last verse, verse 15, the woman said to him, Sir, give me this water that I may not thirst nor come here to draw. And I want to spend some time today looking at this scripture and preach a message titled Living Water. Let's pray. Dear God in heaven, we come to you. God, the only one way anybody can come to you is through Christ. Lord, we have been to church this morning. We have lifted up your name. Your Bible says that if we lift up Jesus, you will draw all men unto you, God. And God, I hide behind the cross today, Lord. I pray that people would not see me, uh, but they would see you, God. God, for you are the only one that can touch a life. That you are the only one that can quench the thirst of our ever so thirsty soul. And so, God, we just simply um, present you today. And I should have, ask you to have the Holy Spirit help me to do that. In Jesus' name we pray, and everybody said, Amen. Amen. Every time I minister, I want to share a story about, uh, there was a preacher in England years ago named Charles Spurgeon. He's known as the Prince of Preachers in the 1800s. And a businessman from America went to England, and a friend brought him to church. And they went to church, and after the service, the friend says, What did you think of the service? And the businessman said, What a powerful speaker. Well, the next night, they went here, Charles Spurgeon to preach. And that same friend said, what did you think about the service? And he said, what a powerful Christ. Amen. I believe when we come together uh, as believers and you come to church, I hope you leave the door not with, hey, thank God for your pastor, and he, he ought to be a nice guy, and he ought to be a lovely guy. That's all things that Christians should be. And, and all the people should be friendly, absolutely. But hopefully you leave the door with the billboard above your head is what a powerful Christ. Because he truly is powerful. The book of John, just a little bit of background. John referred to himself as disciple that Jesus loved. In this book here, John, John doesn't even refer to himself as John. He just refers to himself as the, the disciple that Jesus loved. He was known as the apostle of love. John was so in awestruck about how much God loved him. Let me ask you a question. Are you in awestruck? Well, yeah, Jesus loved. I learned the song in Sunday school. Jesus loves me. This. But are you in your heart awestruck how much God loves you? John was a man that saw the love of God. He, he was consumed with He could not believe God loved him. Earlier in the Bible, in, in, in the book of Mark, John was referred to, when Jesus called the disciples, John was referred to as a son of thunder. Let me tell you who John was before he was this disciple whom Jesus loved. He was a man that wanted to call fire down on some people because they mistreated Jesus. They were, they were not treating Jesus. They were not giving Jesus his right honor. And John says, hey, hey God, let's just call fire down on them and kill them. But God took that man, John, the son of thunder, and did something in his heart that he just referred to himself as the disciple whom Jesus loved. You know, there is no such thing as perfection in Christianity, but there is such thing as change. You cannot come to Jesus and not change. Now, there's no such thing as perfection. You've got to go to heaven to find a perfect church, a perfect man, a perfect woman. But you cannot come to Jesus and not change. It's impossible. You change. You change. How do you know that you have a living relationship with a living God? Is you're not the same person anymore. Amen. Now, I'm not saying perfection. 
People that preach you become perfect uh, after you get saved, they're committing the sin of lying because uh, you, that's a lie. You're not perfect. But you serve a perfect God. Amen. What about this man, John? 80 times in his writings he referred to the word love. 80 times. 25 times in this gospel he referred to truth. 20 times he referred to truth in his epistles that he wrote besides this gospel. And 100 times in the Gospel of John, he referred to belief. What is John trying to tell us in this book? This man, John. He wants us to believe the truth. So that we can enter in a relationship with a loving God. That's John's purpose of this book. He, he wants you to believe the truth. Because you cannot have... I went out to eat one, one night with uh, a, a group of Bible college students at our church, and uh, we were at a restaurant. And this waitress came by, and, and we started to talk to her about the Lord. And she made a comment to us. She said, why every time y'all say something about God, y'all say, well, the Bible says. Don't you have your own opinion? And me and my friends were sitting there talking, and we said, uh, no. No. <laughs> well, that's not the way I see it, she said. And I said, okay. Um, I wasn't being rude. And I said, well, under what authority do you base what you see? And she goes, well, that's just my opinion. I said, okay. I said, well, you work at this restaurant. This is Logan's restaurant. It's closed down out of Baton Rouge, but at least they opened up a Longhorn Steakhouse there. But... Uh, <laughs> I said, you work at Logan's, if you walk up to take my order, and I say, I want a Sonic Glass with a Walker Jr. and a Caniac, what would you tell me? She would say, well, we don't sell a Sonic Glass, a Walker with cheese and a Caniac. I ever want one, and I think I should have one. I got a lot of money in my pocket, and I'll pay you, and I'll tip you well. Just get your car, and get it for because I want it. I mean, I think I should have it, and I can pay for it. And she said, she started laughing, she said, we don't, we don't, we don't. I said, oh, so you're under the authority of the Logan's menu, and you are operating under that for your job. Yeah. I said, so you're okay with operating under the authority of this menu, and you won't give me what I want just because I think my opinion is I should have it, but when you're dealing with your eternity, because the Bible says it's a point a man wants to die, then to judgment, don't you think you ought to have your understanding a little bit based on some authority, not just, well, that's just the way I see it. <laughs> I mean, that may work if we like chocolate ice cream, strawberry, or vanilla, but I think when it comes to eternity, we ought to pay a little bit more close attention to the authority of God's Word. So my time with you today is, you know, I, I'm not here to talk about Keith and my opinion. I want to look at the Word and see what it says to us. But if we wanted to know what the purpose of the book of John is, Zoe, I don't know if you could go there real quick, but I want us to see it in Scripture. I think it's important for you to see it. But John um, chapter 20. Verse 31, let's look at this, 21 verse, uh, 30, John 20 verse 31. So what's the purpose of John? What's John trying to say? So if you can help me out, uh, John chapter 20 verse 31. So, so this is, I want you to see this. This is what this man John is trying to tell us in this book. But these are written that you might believe. That Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing ye might have life through His name. That's the purpose that John's trying to get us to see here. you got to believe the truth. To have a relationship with Jesus, you have to know the truth. You have to believe the truth. So in this story today, John brings in a woman... We're going to talk about this woman, but we're not going to get away from the purpose of John, why he's writing this book. We're not going to get away from that. But he, the, the theme is not so much going to be uh, this woman, although she is in this book and she is part of this story, but we're not deviating from this purpose. So the Bible says that Jesus went to Samaria. Now, geographical, that was a shorter route to get where he was going. Um, where Jesus would head to Galilee. And some people would say, well, he went to Samaria because it's only natural to go the shortest distance to get somewhere. 
But I believe Jesus had a bigger reason to go to Samaria, because then it was just more of a shorter route. Because see, you have to understand the culture of that time. Samaritans were looked at as outcasts. Samaritans were looked at as Jews didn't associate with these people. And this woman was not just a Samaritan, she was a woman. Now, religious, I'm not a religious person, and I'm, I'm, I'm so, I get tickled at times, I don't know if it's mainly to say you get tickled, uh, Pastor Eric, but I, I get tickled at times, people say, well, you know, Keith, I'm not as religious as you, and I say, man, I'm the furthest thing from religion. And they're like, well, I thought you like help out at a church. I said, I do. Well, then how can you say you're not religious? I said, man, I am not, I am zero, 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 point zero percent religious. And they look at me like, I don't understand that. Um, Christianity is not a religion. Religion is a man-made system. Amen. So this system, this religious system, not only was she a Samaritan, she was a woman. And this religious system that was going on, you didn't talk to women in public. And especially if you was a Jew and you was a rabbi, uh, you didn't even, if your woman was your wife, you wouldn't even talk to her in public. This like religion rules can get crazy, man. I meet so many people that say, I don't want nothing to do with Jesus. And the more I talk to them, they've never met Jesus. All they've met is religion. And if the only thing I knew about Jesus was religion, I wouldn't want to have nothing to do with him either. <laughs> but I thank God that it's not about religion. Amen. He didn't go to Samaria because it was a shorter route. There was a divine appointment with a woman. Jesus sat down at the well because he was thirsty. We, John presents the humanity side of Jesus. He was thirsty. Somebody said, well, how can God get thirsty? Jesus was 100% God and he was 100% man. He's the only 200% man to ever live. You have to be saved. You have to know that Jesus Christ is God in the flesh. He's not some religion say, well, he's a good man and he was a prophet. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says He was the Son of God. And the only way you can get to God is through Jesus. And the only way you can get to Jesus is you accept what He did for you. Accept who He was, which was the Son of God. God in the flesh. That's what John presents in this book. Look, Keith, I don't, Keith, I don't know what you're talking That's what, I didn't come up with that. that. That's what it says in here. I don't have an opinion on that. So we have to believe who Jesus was. Son of God, and we have to believe what Jesus did. He paid the sin debt for mankind. Why did he have to die? Because that was the only way you and I could be brought back to God. Christianity is a mountain. We live in Colorado here. We don't have mountains in Louisiana. We have anthills that are about that tall, but <laughs> more mountains. Christianity is a mountain. And if you go, I'm sure Pastor Eric, y'all have some kind of common stores where we've got gloves and cables and boots. REI. What's that? REI. REI. Well, if you go to REI and start getting some gloves and cables and boots and the proper techniques to climb, as far as Christianity, you don't understand Christianity. Christianity is a mountain, and it's uh, saying that if i got to climb that mountain, I'm doomed. And there has to be another way. Christianity is a golf. And if you go start taking swimming lessons and buying scuba gear, start practicing your breathing and your breast stroke, you don't understand Christianity. Christianity is, I can't swim that golf. And if i got to swim the golf, I can't, I, I, I'm doomed. There has to be another way. And God says, I have the other way. I climbed the mountain. That's why religion... Rough gets, you know who killed Jesus was not the drunks and the whores. Who killed Jesus was religious people. That's right. Um, they didn't like that. You mean to tell me all the things that I've done, and I've done this, and I've done that, and I've done this, and I've done that, and I'm saying you can do all of that. If you're climbing that mountain on your own strength, trying to, you don't understand the Bible. There had to be another way. That's Jesus. That's, that's why God had to become man. I can't save myself. I can't deliver myself. And if I, people ask me all the time, Keith, um, why do you think you're going to go to heaven? I have one word to answer them. One word and one word alone. Jesus. Right. Not where I go to church. 
not whether I drank or not drank, or uh, back taught my mama or not back taught my mama. That has zero to do. Now, let me say something. Let me bring balance. When Christ comes into your life, He changes you. And guess what? We should learn how to talk right, and live right, and do right. But we can't put the cart before the horse. Jesus creates in you the will and the do. He, he creates in you the will to live for Him. And He gives you the ability to do what you can't do for yourself. He was a man. He was thirsty. He was thirsty. And this woman comes to Him at the same hour, that 12 o'clock hour. Now, we've got to look at this. The women didn't go there at this time. They would usually go in the afternoon to get the water. That was the woman's job, to get the water for the family. The men would work all day long, and the women would get the water. But she shows up at 12 o'clock in the afternoon, hot. This is not the time that they would go. Let me jump ahead about this woman. This woman had been married five times. And I study in this the... Maybe the issue of shame, maybe the issue of embarrassment in the community. When all the other women, all the people that had it going on, they would go together just having a good talk and having this and that. She didn't feel comfortable with going with everybody. Why did Jesus go to Samaria? Because there was a woman there. Yes. One woman. And so Jesus tells her, give me a drink. Guys, in these scriptures that I read you, 15 times the word water, drink, or thirst is talked about. That's the theme of what I'm reading. Water, drink, thirst. Anybody, who's, and I'm not elevating this issue of her being married five times. It could be anybody in their life. Obviously, she was thirsty for something. Relationship after relationship. Guys, the law back then, we're talking about a time where she was living in the Ten Commandments strictly said, Thou shalt not commit adultery. That, you know, divorce was looked at as, I mean, you, I mean, some religions, you get divorced and you better go live under a bridge. I don't know if y'all have bridges in Colorado, but, but I mean, that, some religions, that's how you get treated. You get divorced, you can never uh, be a preacher. You get divorced, you never can, can be a, a certain thing in your society. Uh, I mean, this woman was living that kind of life. And Jesus tells her to give him a drink. His disciples had went away to get some food. And she says to him, you being a Jew, well, how did she know he was a Jew? Well, probably by his dress. They dressed a certain way with their apparel. How can you be a Jew and ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? She knew. She knew the culture. She knew. What, 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 you know, you're not supposed to be taught. I mean, what are you doing talking to me? For the Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. And Jesus said to her, If you knew the gift of God and who it was that says to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you a living. This woman has no idea who he is. She has no understanding of the things of God. She has no understanding of the, the Bible, the Torah, the law, uh, or as far as the, the scripture, the theology of things, so to say. She don't know who's talking to her. But they're dialoguing about thirst. And what Jesus is doing here is giving us a beautiful example of how evangelism really works. The woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with. She don't get it. She, she think, she, when he said that about the, the living water, she's still thinking natural. She's still, still thinking, you don't have nothing to get the water out of the well. And the well is deep. Where then do you get this living water? Maybe she was thinking that because it was a deep well that there was some kind of healing properties in the water. But how are you going to get this living water? This dialogue is going on and she still does not get it. Let me tell you something. Jesus looked past the issue that she was a Samaritan. He looked past the issue that she was a woman. He looked past that she was ignorant of the things of God. He looked past the issue that she was married five times. Living with a man at the sixth time, not married to him. He looked past of her shame. He looked past that she was there at 12 o'clock instead of coming at all the other times. But he's getting to the heart of where her life is. She said, are you, not, are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us this well and drank from it himself? You see, water, drank, thirst. 
as well as his sons and his livestock. And Jesus had answered and said, whoever drinks of this water will thirst again. So now Jesus is turning it around that he's getting to get her to think about not just some physical water. Whoever drinks of this water, this well right here, they're going to thirst again. Thirst was her issue. So many of us in life, and in my, in my life, we strive and we strive and we strive. And there's nothing wrong with having goals. I'm big on goals and accomplishing things and dreams and stuff. But you have to ask yourself, Hollywood is full of goal achievers. Hollywood is full of dream achievers. Hollywood is full of success. I remember in high school, uh, the band Nirvana, when they hit the, the scene when I was in high school, Kurt Cobain, you can't reach a level of success more than that young man, but he put a pistol in his mouth. I would have to ask the question, if success is what it's all about, if status is what it's all about, if, if all we're striving for, we look at Hollywood, they've reached all of that, and we read about it in the paper, just turn your TV on and look at what that has got them. I'm not throwing them under the bus, but I'm just saying this, the only thing that can satisfy the soul of man is Jesus. That's what he's trying to get this woman. It's not your relationship with men. Nothing wrong with having a relationship. Uh, nothing wrong at all. Nothing wrong with marriage. Nothing wrong with friendship. Nothing wrong. But, but that's not going to quench the thirst. But whosoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. But the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. Now this woman's saying, man, wow. What is this all about? And look how she responds in verse 15. Then the woman said to him, Sir, give me this water that I may not thirst nor come here to draw. Oh, that's what people need. They need to drink from the fountain of God to have their soul, their thirst quenched. Talking about evangelism here, but listen what Jesus does. I already told you. Jesus told her about this drink, but look how Jesus wants to deal with the heart of the matter of man. Look what he tells her in verse 16. Jesus said to her, so everybody would read right now and say, man, this sounds great. This woman's going through a hard point in life, and, and uh, Jesus is telling her about this living water, and she says, hey, I want this. But look what Jesus did in verse 16. He said, go call your husband and come here. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you, you have said, well, you have no husband, verse 18, but you have had five husbands, and the one whom you have is not your husband, in that you spoke truly. This is what God wants to deal with. He wants to deal with our sin. And people say, nowadays, don't talk about sin, don't, 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 don't say that word, don't talk about hell, don't talk about the, all these things. If Jesus talked about it, and he's our example, then we need to talk about it. Amen. And I don't want to be rude in saying that because we all have sinned. The Bible says that we all have sinned, and what it really means, we all have sinned and we are continuously, the Bible says that we come short of the glory of God. What that really means is we are continuously coming short of the glory of God. Jesus told her about this living water. He told her that you'll never thirst again. She said, I want it. And he said, well, go call your husband. I don't have a husband. You're right. You had five. And you're living with the sixth man. Why did he do that? Did he do that to, to, to be mean? Did he do that? No, that was, that was her struggle. She was looking for this completion. That She was looking, I want to be loved. I want to be somebody. I want to be recognized. And she's going from relationship to relationship to relationship. Why was she, You didn't go to the well at 12 o'clock. All the women went to the well in the afternoon. Why was she there? She was living a life of shame. That's what sin does to you. The devil brings the condemnation and like we sang about this morning, cast your burdens on him. He wants to take that from you. Jesus wants to take that from this woman. Now watch what happens to this woman. She's, now, now this shows the divinity of the deity of Jesus. Jesus being thirsty, John tells us of him being a human. He got thirsty. But now the fact Jesus had never met this woman before and he told her, she went on to say that this man had told me all about myself. That shows the deity of Christ, the God of who he was. 
Watch what this woman wants to do in verse 9. I'll just verse 19. The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, and the Jews say that in Jerusalem is the place where one ought to worship. So it's amazing. After Jesus tells her this, what she wants to do, she wants to worship. That ought to be something that in a heart and life of a believer, that once you learn about this living water, that you can never, you'll never thirst again. We're looking at a woman that was an outcast. And after she hears about this living water, she wants to worship God. And, and sometimes we, we like, I'm just tired of, you know, we sing so many songs and they keep singing the same. I know at our church, people say all the time, how do y'all sing the same song over and over and over? <laughs> I mean, come on. <laughs> this woman wanted to worship. That's what it says. She started talking about worship. Jesus said, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. He's telling her, you don't even, you don't, she don't even really know yet who he is. So he's telling her, you want to worship, and you don't even know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But that hour is coming, and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman, then the woman said to him, I know that the Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. And Jesus, for the first time, the Bible talks about what the disciples said about him. The Bible's talked about what John said about him, what John the Baptist said about him. But you see in the scripture right here in verse 26, Jesus said, I who speak to you am he. I'm that person. At this point, his disciples came. Disciples didn't have it all together either. Look what they came back and said. They marveled and they talked. They, the disciples come back from water and they marveled. What are you talking to that woman for? You're supposed to be talking to the, to the woman. What are you talking to that woman for? What do you seek and why are you talking with her? The Bible says in verse 28 that the woman left her water pot. Sometimes we have to leave our water pot. Uh, you know, what is the water pot that you're craving for thirst? And it's, it's what you are holding on to that um, you're searching for and you're carrying it around. But it's not God. The Bible says that she left her water pot and went her way into the city and said to the men. So think about this. We've got a woman now that's living a shamed life, going to the well to get water at an odd time, married five times. Now she's going into the city, and she's saying, come see a man who told me all the things I ever did. Could this be the Christ? This woman now is not shameful. Guess what? Jesus will take your shame and cast it away. Jesus will take your past and cast it away. This woman had felt this living water. She didn't care about what people thought about it anymore because you know, it does hurt when people think something about us and they do think certain things about us when this happens or that happens. But you've got to know as a, as a Christian how God thinks about you. You're the apple of His eye. That's why He went to the cross. If there would only been one person on this earth that would have given their heart to Christ. Jesus would have came and died for that one person. No more shame. She's now going around being a missionary. Saying, you got to come see this man. you got to come see this man. And in verse 39, Zoe, if you can help me out, verse 39, and I'm going to close. Watch what happens in verse 39. And many of the Samaritans of that city believed what's John trying to accomplish in the book? He's trying to present so that you would believe the truth so that you would have a living relationship with a loving God. 
Many of the Samaritans of that city believed on him. That's what John's, you got to believe on Christ for the saying of the woman. This woman must have went around that town. That way he was embarrassed to go to the well at a certain time. Now she's going around the town telling everybody about Jesus and what he did for her. In closing, Pastor Eric, if you can come up. What I want to leave you with today is that there's a thirst in all of us. It don't have to always be wicked things, man. Sometimes we, we get in church and we just assume that, oh, it's the person hooked on drugs and it's the person that's an alcoholic and it's the person that this and the person that that. Sometimes, guys, you can be dry just from the cares of life. Just the cares of everyday life. And sometimes we are in situations because we live in this fallen world. Certain things come about and we're striving to find that completeness. We're striving to find that identity in things. And guess what? We just constantly are thirsty and thirsty and thirsty. And I want to elevate the scripture to you today. For you to think of this woman. He said, if you knew who it was who was saying to you about this drink, you would ask me. And I would give you this gift. And it would be a living water. And if you drink of this water, you'll never thirst again. Have you been to the well of Jesus and drank from the water that he has to give? That's my prayer. He'll keep quenching that thirst. He'll keep quenching that thirst. Maybe if there's some shame in your life, I want this woman to be an example that after she met Jesus, there was no shame. Maybe if you're religious in this place today and you're kind of thinking, well, you know, you got to look at how Jesus treated this woman compared to how even maybe his disciples were kind of questioning in some things. But I want to elevate Christ to you today. See the beauty of Christ. See the heart of this man, John. That he was awestruck much God loved him. I don't know probably as much as Brother Eric about the Bible, but I do know this at eight years old. This is not a, this, this is a mental thing for probably Christianity is not a mental thing. That's not what God deals with. It's not intellectually. It's with your heart. And as an eight-year-old boy, I didn't understand it all. I can't explain it to you from top to bottom, but my heart came and enveloped with the love of God. And I'm 44 years old today right now and nothing in my life has ever captivated me like the love of God. It's controlled my life. I haven't done everything right, but it consumes me. So when we worship, yes, we raise our hands. Yes, we say thank you, Jesus, because I'm amazed that He loves me. I'm amazed that He can take my shame and brush it away. I'm amazed that he'll present me to God one day as faultless. I'm amazed at that. I'm amazed at that. Would you please stand to me? And I want to pray for you today if there's anything um, that you just need to touch. If you're thirsty today. And you need a you need a, you need a touch. I'm not here to know what you're dealing with. That's not my business. That's God's business. But I'll agree with you in faith. And as Brother Eric sings something, plays something, I'm going to spend just a few minutes at the altar. I'm going to ask you to come forward. I'd love to pray with you as we close our service.
ask you to take a moment. Two things. If, if there's not a living relationship with Christ, with God, uh, I'm going to pray with you in a second. And I want you to just repeat these words after me. And the second thing we're going to pray about is if whatever water pot you're carrying around that's you're trying to get your thirst out of. We're going to pray today that you will be like this woman. That you'll leave that water pot because you found something to quench your thirst. So my first prayer, I'll let you pray this and I ask everybody to repeat after me. Saying a prayer won't save you. You can say something until you're 90 years old and repeat something over and over and over that don't save a person. But believing what you pray will save a person. So why don't you just, Pastor Eric is going to help us as we repeat this. And if you're not saved today, if you don't know Jesus, if religion is something that you have and you don't have a relationship, God wants to give you this living water. So repeat after me. Say, Dear God in heaven, Dear God in heaven, I come to you. I come to you in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. I'm sorry for my sins. I'm sorry for my sins. For I am a sinner. For I am a sinner. God, I don't know you. God, I don't know you. God, I ask you right now. God, I ask you right now. To forgive me of my sins. To forgive me of my sins. To wash me. To wash me. To cleanse me. To cleanse me. To change me. To change me. God, right now. God, right now. I believe in my heart. I believe in my heart. And I confess with my mouth. I confess with my mouth. That you sent your son Jesus. That you sent your son Jesus. To die on a cross. To die on a cross. For me. For me. And God, he was buried. God, he was buried. And he rose again. And he rose again. For me. For me. I place my faith. I place my faith. In what Jesus did. In what Jesus did. For me. For me. And God. And God. According to your word. According to your word. Because of my faith, because of my faith, is in Christ. It's in Christ. And what He did, what He did, I can gladly say. I can gladly say. I can boldly say. I can boldly say that I am forgiven. That I am forgiven. That I am washed. That I am washed. That I am cleansed. That I am cleansed in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Let me just pray over everybody here today. Lord, we love you today. God, I thank you for this time that we've had. God, your word says that man shall not live by bread alone, Lord, but without every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. God, your word is food to our soul. God, I know that your Bible says that your word does not come back void. So God, let this man, John, be an example to us. Let us be people that if we had to refer to ourselves to somebody, we would just in our hearts say, I'm just somebody that Jesus loves. Amen. God, let us think about this woman today about her life. But God, you went the short distance not because of convenience or geographical reasons, but you went this reason for a divine appointment. That you cared about this woman. You look past religion, you look past culture, you look past her faults. God, you met her at her need. God, meet us at our need today. God, we worship you as not just a prophet, but God, we worship you as the Messiah, the Son of God. And God, we leave our water pot today because we have tasted of your goodness. God, help us to be like this woman that we will worship you, want to worship you, and that we'll want to tell others about you. She told the people of her city, come see a man. God, let that be in us today. We love you so much. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's give Jesus a hand.